Hey, good morning, River Oak. Uh, my name is Caleb Waldrop, and I am the pastor of Student Ministries, um, and I get to continue this uh, series in the parables that we're doing. Uh, this morning, we're going to be in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Um, and so just to get us on the same page quickly, whether you're at home or whether you're here with us, um, a parable is actually defined as to, to cast alongside. If you look at the definition of a parable, it means to cast alongside. And so what a parable does is it takes a new truth and it casts it alongside something familiar so that you have a new view of uh, the reality or, or whatever it is. And so the way Jesus would use parables is he would um, take this new truth of his kingdom and he would cast it alongside something familiar such as farming um, or agriculture or whatever it is so that they would then understand how he was establishing his kingdom, how he was establishing his new kingdom. And so uh, he would use these parables, he would add twists to them and surprises to them so that um, they were memorable and that you could remember them. And so if you understand that that is what a parable is, you understand it in that context, then you will better understand what he's saying when he talks about these parables. And so just keep that in mind as we read um, this morning. So this morning we're in Luke chapter 13, like I said. I'm going to invite you all, just in reverence of reading God's word, to stand with me. It reads like this. It says, At the time, some people came and reported to him, being Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Uh, that's actually more brutal than you probably even realize. It says, And he, Jesus, responded to them, Do you think that these Galileans were more sinful than all the other Galileans because they suffered these things? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as well. Or, verse 4, those 18 that the tower, of Salome, the tower in Siloam fell on and killed. Do you think they were more sinful than all the other people who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as well. And he told this parable. A man had a fig tree that was planted in his vineyard. So that first part, not a parable. One through five, not a parable. That's real stuff. Six, just to <laughs> clarify. Six through nine, definitely a parable. He told the parable, a man had a fig tree and he planted it in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it and found none. He told the vineyard worker, listen, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it even waste the soil? But he, the vineyard worker, replied to him, sir, leave it this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. Perhaps it will produce fruit next year. But if not, you can cut it down. This is a small passage that has giant implications. See, it was left open-ended, meaning that the, the reader or the listener has to supply the conclusion, meaning we have to supply the conclusion in this parable. And so that's my heart for you this morning. That's my hope for you this morning, is that we would come to some conclusions, um, come to some conclusions about the health of our heart, come to some conclusions about the fruit in our life, come to some conclusions about God's purpose and plan for us. That's my hope and my prayer for you. I'm going to pray for us real quick. God, I thank you. Uh, for this time together, Lord, we um, recognize you are sovereign. We recognize that you um, lay out and plan our life. Lord, we recognize that you have brought us here in this moment, whether we are watching from our homes um, or whether we are here in this room. God, you have ordained this moment. And so, God, we ask that you would receive the glory, but, Lord, that you would give us wisdom and understanding of your word that you would help us to, to have the humility to see ourselves um, clearly and realistically, Lord, that we um, would be able to grow from this moment, be changed in this moment, Lord, that your will would be done in us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Or you can stand. You do whatever you want. I don't care, actually. Um, so, you may not know this, uh, but we came very, very close to never preaching this sermon, to never having this sermon uh, preached. I was telling some friends yesterday, actually, that um, two weeks ago, two Sundays ago, so not last Sunday, but the Sunday before that, I was actually scheduled to preach, and I was going to preach this passage. Well, the Tuesday before that Sunday, I had a friend who said, you know, I'm feeling kind of sick, and I have a fever. I need to go get tested 
for COVID. And it was like, okay. So out of an abundance of caution, we were like, well, I, I've got to kind of self-quarantine until his test comes back and we know that he's negative and then we'll know that I'm negative. So we're going to go ahead and change the preaching schedule so that Caleb would preach on the 16th. Well, his test comes back negative. I show up to church that Sunday. I was supposed to preach. Okay, I'm going to preach next week. People kept coming in. Oh, you're supposed to preach this week. I'm going to preach next week. Well, then the next, the, the following Tuesday comes up and I meet with a friend and the friend gets feeling sick and the friend goes home and gets tested for COVID and all over again, two weeks in a row, I had to shut my life down out of caution. No one's fault, just pandemic's fault, I don't know, no one's fault, but, but then I decided, you know what, I'm a fan of baseball, and if we get three strikes, like, we're out, we're done, like, I will print the sermon material just to shred it, like, that's how I'm feeling, but so this week I decided that I would try to take control of my own life, and I, uh, I just wore a mask constantly, I was like, I'm gonna wear a mask to everything, all the time, and it was good until um, like dinner time, and my wife's like, please take that off. And I'm like, not today, Satan. I'm like, no. I realized, though, I realized for real the last two weeks that I have zero control. Like, things are just outside of my control. Like, I, I just, I, there was nothing that I can do, and it, and it, occurs, it occurred to me that control is one of those things that, that we think we have until life happens and we don't. Like, control is something that we think we have until a pandemic happens. And then we realize over the last few months, I don't really have a whole lot of control of things. Control is something that we think we have until a car wreck happens. Control is something that we think we have until one cell inside our body mutates and replicates itself in a vital area that we call cancer. And then we don't. And I think it's in those moments, not that we lose control, but that we realize we never had control. Yet from the beginning of time, you think of Adam and Eve, you think of every person in all of humanity, from the beginning of time, they found some comfort in this hands-on-the-wheel lifestyle that simulates some kind of control. In Luke chapter 13, it's this incident of a mass murder that, that things were, were chaos. Everyone would have known about this. It's a moment where the people of this time looked back and said, things are out of control. Pilate was uh, who Jesus would later meet with right before his crucifixion was putting uh, C, uh, the insignia of Caesar all over Jerusalem. Signs and, and banners and all the things of, of these Romans in the holy city of Jerusalem. And so people were not happy with that. The Jews were not happy with that. They are protesting that. They are rioting against that. Like it, it sounds a lot like what's been happening in our world recently. That there was just chaos and, and there was, was, was craziness that was going on because of the chaos. The world was unstable, and then they report to Jesus. They say, hey, Jesus, did you hear about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices? Now, you need to understand at this time, the only reason a Jew would be sacrificing anything is because they were celebrating Passover. So to paint the picture, there were some Galileans who were celebrating Passover as commanded in the Old Testament in their temple, in their church. In their church, performing sacrifices, Pilate sends in Roman soldiers into their church at their time of worship and massacres them in such a way that their blood is mixed with their sacrifices' blood that is on the altar. It is the definition of brutality and of hate. And they said, Jesus, did you hear about it? It says he responded in verse 2, 
do you think that these Galileans who were murdered were more sinful than any other Galileans because they suffered these things? See, this is an interesting response from Jesus. Like, without knowing their intention of the people who reported it, you'd be like, man, that's a, like a weird way to come at this conversation. But Jesus knows your heart and your mind. And he knew the intentions of their hearts and their minds. And so that's the direction he went when he answered. See, the question that was on the minds of these people was, hey, did this happen to these people because they were more sinful? Like, what part did their actions play in their death? What did they do to lose control of their life? They had this thought that if they did bad, then they would get bad. These people must have done bad, and so they got bad. And so then Jesus, in verse 4, it explains verse 4, because then Jesus says, well, if it happened to the Galileans, if that's your train of thought for the Galileans, then it also has to be your train of thought for these 18 that the tower in Siloam fell on, who were just simply going to work. They were simply going about their life, and yet a tower fell on them and killed them. He says, were they more sinful also than anyone else? See, these people had this thought that if you did good things, then you got good things. And if you did bad things, then you got bad things. And their statement to Jesus was like, hey, did you hear what happened? They must have done something pretty bad. Criminal psychologists actually have a term for this way of thinking because a lot of us think this way. And this is probably going to, you're going to see things differently after I tell you this. They call it victimization. The definition of victimization is when you hear about someone suffering and you conclude that they have some level of responsibility in their becoming a victim. They have some level of responsibility in becoming a victim. So what this looks like is you hear someone who got assaulted. You hear about it on the news, maybe it was a friend of yours, and then you conclude, man, they must have been at the wrong place at the wrong time. Man, they they must have hung out with the wrong friends. They must have said the wrong thing. You know, the reason I wouldn't be assaulted is I don't go there at that time. I don't do those things at that time. I know how to make peace with people that I don't, I'm not a fighter. I can resolve conflict that I, people are scared of me. I wouldn't get assaulted like they did something to cause themselves to get assaulted. You hear about someone who gets in a car wreck. You say, man, they must have been texting. They were probably driving too fast. They probably ran the red light. Maybe they was driving in the rain. I don't drive in the rain. I'm a safe driver. I pay attention better than they do. Their fault for getting in the wreck, I won't get in the wreck in the same way because I won't do what they do. Oh, someone caught coronavirus? Ah, they must have worn their mask too much. Oh, they didn't wear their mask enough. Oh, they washed their hands too. No, they didn't wash their hands enough. Whatever it is that they did, I'm not going to do. I take precautions. And so I won't get what they got. You hear about someone getting skin cancer? I wear sunscreen. I don't, get, I don't get skin cancer. I protect myself. I'm outside. I wear long sleeves. It is their fault. They played a part in their own victimization. And he's saying to these people, he's saying, hey, were they more sinful? Is that what you're saying? That they were more sinful? That they played a part in their own death? He's challenging this do good, get good thought. Which, by the way, is a completely invalid way of viewing our world. Like, can you imagine that? If you only did good and that meant you only got good, so you did real good things and every time you walked outside, you just found $20 on the side of the road and you drive down the road, right, and you don't even wear a seatbelt? Why? Because you're too good to get in a car wreck. My son, he doesn't wear a helmet when he rides his bike because he's too good to fall off. He's too good to get hit by a car. Like, that's not the way our world works. Like, and if you're bad, then only bad things happen. That you better buckle up, you better get an extra safety harness in that car. Because every time you leave, you're going to get in a car wreck. And every time you go outside, you're going to get skin cancer. 
Like, if you open your eyes and walk outside, you realize, no, no, good things happen to bad people all the time, and bad things happen to good people all the time, that our world actually doesn't function in this get good, do good, get good, or do bad, get bad mentality. Like, it doesn't work out. And so Jesus replies to him, and he says, no, no, not saying that they were innocent, not saying that these people were innocent at all. He's just simply saying they're not more guilty than you. He says, but I tell you, unless you repent, you will all perish as well. Like, I don't know how, what kind of person, when you think of Jesus, how you view him, like as the soft guy that's like well-groomed beard, nice hair, brushed well, got a little bit of makeup on, like pretty. Like, this is Jesus. He's like, no, matter of fact, you're going to die also. What we conclude from the people who died in this temple, what we conclude from the people who had a um, tower fell, fall on them is that they died unprepared, is that death snuck up on them that they weren't ready to die. The people who left the town or left to go and walk by that tower didn't tell their family like, hey, see you never, like adios. No, like they did not think, hey, I'm going to go to celebrate Passover, see you on the other side of eternity. No, like they had no idea. Like death snuck up on them. And this isn't a surprise for us. Like this is the way the world works. I, you think about our own history. You go back to 9-11, where 2,000 people left in the morning, kissed their family goodbye, and never came home. I think about it in my own life. In 2006, I have a friend go to Afghanistan, knowing the risk, but expecting to come home and never makes it. I think about in 2011 getting a phone call because my brother's a sheriff's deputy and he's taking his partner home and we get a phone call that they got in a wreck and one died and one is life flighted. Not knowing until we get to the scene who died and who got life flighted. Was it my brother who died or his best friend and partner who died and our family friend? Get there to realize my brother was life flighted and it was his best friend who died. I think of my grandmother in 2013, my great-grandmother finds herself at 104 years old on her deathbed having labored breathing. And I think in that moment, if you would ask her, she knew death was coming, but yet wouldn't expect that that was the day that death would come. You think a few weeks ago in Beirut, over 160 people wake up in the morning to do their thing and life, life ends. They didn't expect that. That wasn't, death sneaks up on us. I mean, think about it. Like 10 minutes ago, I was graduating college. 10 minutes before that, I was like learning to ride a bike. And now I find myself with a family and some kids who are like looking like dad. And I'm like, me, what? So it's no wonder to think in what's going to feel like 10 minutes from now, we're going to be 70, 80, 90 years old on our own deathbeds, gasping for air, saying, man, how did we get here? If, if we make it to that point, if today is not our last, that death sneaks up on us and to these religious leaders who, find, who try to find righteousness and be right with God by doing good things, Jesus says, without repentance, when you die, you will also be caught by surprise. When you die, you will also be found in debt to God. That the fruit of their life was good deeds. And scripture says that our good deeds are mere filthy rags to God. He says, man, you likewise will be caught by surprise. And it leads into this parable. In verse 6, he says there was this man who had a fig tree that was planted in his vineyard. Now, fig trees are very common. They're very valuable in Israel. It says that he came looking for fruit on it, and he found none. And so he told the vineyard worker, 
Listen, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this tree, and I haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it even waste the soil? There's this level of irritation, right? There's this level of disgust in in the man who owns the vineyard. That he has a tree that is fruitless, that won't produce fruit. And this fig tree is a symbol of the people who would hear Jesus and see Jesus and put Jesus off. It's the people who have made their faith a list of moral practices. It's when church is limited to just one hour a week and we call that our righteous deed. It's when you don't grow into the joy and the worship of God. It's when you don't grow into God's, into the love of God's power and God's glory. He's like, man, we are the fig tree that produces zero fruit when we're just doing the religious acts. There is no real heart change when we hear it and just push it off. And instead, we're always busy trying to be good and trying to do good. And Jesus is saying in this parable, hey, you think that's the kind of fruit that I want? You think that's the life that is pleasing to me? He says, man, that's not what I want. The fruit that I want is your submission and your repentance and your worship. And yet we're busy just trying to be good. One thing that drew me to this parable is you see two characteristics of God in it. One, you see this characteristic that God is just. That you see that he has this sorrow and this anger towards people who would look like they bear good fruit, who would have it all together. These I would call the people of religion that have all the practices right. But anyone knows who's ever grown any fruit-bearing plant that it really doesn't matter what the plant looks like. It doesn't matter how pretty it is. It doesn't matter how tall it is. It doesn't matter what the, fruit, what, what the tree looks like because what the tree looks like doesn't determine whether it bears fruit. But really what matters is what the soil is doing. It matters what nutrients are getting into the soil, what water is getting into the soil. It matters how the nutrients are being absorbed into the plant that causes it to bear good fruit. You see this, this anger and this justice side of God. But then there's this patience and there's this longing in the middle of it. In verse 8, you see, but the vineyard worker replied to him, Sir, leave it this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And perhaps it will produce fruit next year. This next year isn't like, perhaps in the next 365 days it will produce fruit. This next year is in the next season, the next harvest, in the next allotted amount of time. Give it some more time. Maybe in this next harvest, in this next season. It'll produce fruit. But if it does not, you can cut it down. It's the side of God who's gracious and merciful and patient with us that says, hey, give it more time. Give it more time. The scripture says God is not uh, forgetting to come and rescue his people, but rather he is patient with his people that we may know him. He says, man, let me use more resources. Let me add more fertilization. Let me cultivate their heart a little bit more. Man, this is what Jesus, I believe, would describe as a cultivation period, a fertilization period. What's happening right now in this moment is this is a moment where you should be being challenged and pressed should cause you to reflect and consider, man, what is the, the fruit of my heart and of my life? So we're doing. Are we bearing fruit? Or are we just being an observer of this great faith? I've had a lot of death talk in the last few minutes. So I want to like wrap you up with some good news. Here's the good news. Though Jesus is talking about people who would die unprepared, 
underlying within that is that there's a way to die prepared. Yes, death's still on the table. That's still going to happen. I'm sorry about that. But there's a way to approach it prepared. He says, the way that we do that is through repentance. Now, what's really cool about this word repentance, in verse 3 and verse 5, I just laid the verses right on top of each other. But if you go back to the original language, you actually see that the word repentance uh, means two different things. In verse 5, he uses one form of repentance. In verse 3, he uses another form of repentance. In verse 5, the repentance is this once and for all repentance. It's this thought of the way my life, the trajectory of my life, the outcome of my life is one way, and I want to repent from this sinful, flesh-like living. And I want to turn to the God of this world through my faith in Jesus. I recognize that He is the one that cleanses me of my sin. I recognize it's not my good deeds, but rather His goodness and His righteousness that make me right with God. And so that's one kind of repentance. This is once and for all. But then verse 3, he uses this continual moment by moment repentance where it looks like every moment we repent from our flesh, we repent from our wandering hearts, and we run to Jesus. He says, you want to be right with God, man, live a life of continual First, once and for all repentance, and then at every moment, repentance. That that person is the person who produces fruit in their life. Because they soak and they absorb the nutrients of the gospel. What happens when we do that is the gospel begins to change us. The gospel begins to grow us. The gospel begins to transform us into a new creation. One that has no option of whether or not they will produce fruit. They just automatically do because that is the nature of their life. One rooted in Christ, fed by Christ. And those nutrients are good and they produce peace and patience and kindness and love and humility. He says, that person is the one who produces fruit. And so the question here, when we look at this parable, is not, hey, what what happens to the tree? But rather, it's, what's going to happen to me? Where does repentance and faith need to happen in my life? Like, this should cause us to say and look and say, wow, look at that tree. Wow, that's me. And if you're here and you're like, oh, that's not really me. It's especially you. See, in this parable, you see that God is is saying, hey, like, let there be more time. Let there be more time. But there's also that justice side. That there's patience. Or Jesus is saying, I'm calling you. And you're like, I know. I'm calling you. I know. I'm calling, I get it. And then one day it just stops and it will stop. He says, and he cuts that thing down and he plants a tree that produces fruit. It's Romans 1 where he says, man, he gave them to the desires of their own hearts and their lostness. But yet we see in Romans 8 that he even does that in hope that you would come to know and to turn from those sins that you may find him, that you may realize that the love of God overcomes all. So I'm going to invite you to close your eyes and bow your heads. I've left you with some decisions. I've left you with some things to ponder and to meditate on. If you have breath in your lungs... If your heart is beating, sending blood through your body in this moment, if your brain is firing off, then you can rest assured you're still in that harvest time. And I would encourage you, if you hear the voice of Jesus calling you to himself, calling you to a place of repentance, you would listen. God, we love you. 
God, we thank you for your justice and the way you deal with sin, but God, we thank you for your patience. We thank you for your grace and your mercy and your humility that you give us. God, we thank you for Jesus. May we be bold. May we be courageous. May we walk, may we run rather, to you, God. Help us to live a life of repentance. Help us to live a life of fruit bearing that others may taste and see that you are good. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.